Hi, um, welcome to my YouTube channel. Today is going to be a very interesting video about the ECG, how you're going to read an ECG and what approach you need to apply when you are looking at ECG. So whenever you are having an ECG, okay, you know that there's a P wave, there's a QRS, this is PR interval, this is ST, this is T wave and this is QT. And along with that, you need to remember the rhythm rate and the axis okay so you need to keep these things in your mind in orderly fashion because this is how you're going to read that one and this is how you can approach an ecg and you will not miss anything so rhythm rate axis you have p wave over here you have pr interval you have qrs here you have st you have t wave and you have qt over here whenever you're having an ecg first of all you need to make sure that patient's name is uh, you need to confirm that because you need to make sure that you are reading an ECG of the right person the second thing is you need to check here that this ECG is run on a 25 millimeter per second that's a standard rate of the ECG and the calibration over here that's 10 millivolts after that whenever you look at the ECG okay in your subconscious you're gonna get an idea when you look at the ECG particularly about a few things whether it's a tachycardia, bradycardia, whether the QRS is wide or not, and whether this RR is regular or not. Okay, that's that general impression of ECG, you're going to get like that. Now, the first thing is what you need to go um, for is that rhythm. What is rhythm? The sinus rhythm. You need to look for whether it's a sinus rhythm or not. For such a sinus rhythm, you have to look at uh, the QRS and the P. So every QRS should be preceded by the P wave. Uh, that's a sinus rhythm so it's a q over here that is preceded by a q wave uh, a p wave and uh, the best way to look for that is a rhythm strip that is lead to so here every qrs is preceded by p wave so it's a sinus rhythm the next thing is rate okay so for the rate you apply the two methods you know okay depends on the rr is regular or not in this ecg you can see that the rr is regular if rr is regular what you're going to do 300 divided by number of large boxes between the two r's say for in this ecg it's one two three and four that's going to give 75 per minute but in an ecg where the rr are not regular you need to choose a point and you need to count 30 large boxes between these from 1.2 30 large boxes and you need to count the r in those lot between the, the between the 30 large boxes okay in those lot, 30 large boxes and you need to multiply with 10 10 is constant over here say for example we started from here and up to here there are these are the 30 large boxes now we need to count the number of walls one two three four five six say for example there were six so that's going to be 60 beats per minute next thing is about the axis uh, for the axis, you need to choose the lead 1 and lead AVF. Go over here, the 1 and the AVF. So 1 is in your left hand, say for example, and AVF is in your right hand. So depends on the predominance of the QRS complex, you need to point your thumbs upwards or downwards. Say for example, QRS is up over here in the lead V1 and in the AVF it is down. Okay, so according to the thumb which is up, you're going to state it. Okay, so that's the left is in your left left hand so left axis deviation if both are upright that's going to be normal axis deviation say for example the one is down and the avf is up so the right one this right one is up so that's going to be right axis deviation and if both the, are down that is extreme axis deviation so the next thing is um you need to look for is the p wave okay so the p wave you know over here is the p wave so p wave in your limb leads is just two and a half small square wide and tall up to maximum and in your chest lead it is one and a half small square wide up to maximum and the tall okay different uh, pathologies that could be related to a p wave and there is a too tall that is called p pulmonary we know okay if it's too wide okay that's going to be p mitral if there is no p wave we know that it is in the atrial fibrillation and also the rr will be regular now it it could happen that there are more than one type of p waves morphologically that one p wave is like this the other p wave is like this the other p wave is like this so if you have you at least three different types of the p waves and the heart rate is greater than 100 okay that is in the multifocal atrial tachycardia we know that and the multifocal atrial tachycardia is 
is found in the patients with the COPD. Now we are done with the P waves. The next is the PR interval. Okay, remember that in the PR interval, okay, this this is the PR interval. Okay, from um, the start of the P, P to the start of the Q. So that's going to be the PR interval. Okay, the PR interval. Okay, that is two, three to five small squares. You know. Okay, anything that is less than two is uh, less than three. Sorry, that is short PR. That is in Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Okay, and anything that is greater than five, some books say greater than six, they take five to six small boxes as a borderline, and anything um, the any PR interval that is greater than six is called the long PR. Okay, prolonged PR interval. So this is PR interval. So prolonged PR is found in the AV blocks. We know. Let's discuss a little bit about the AV blocks in quickly. So hard blocks av blocks the first degree hard block there's a constant prolongation of the pr interval say for example pr everywhere is six small boxes in second degree type one there's a progressive prolongation of pr interval followed by a drop in qrs followed by again shortening of pr interval and then it starts prolonging and this vicious cycle that keeps on going okay that is second degree type one in second degree type two everything is okay pr might not be prolonged but all of a sudden drop in qrs complex everything is going fine a qrs is not there in the third degree hard block you know that there's no relationship between the p and the qrs atrials are beating at their own and ventricles are beating at their own no relationship between p and r now the next thing is qrs qrs complex so normally if you see a qrs complex from v1 okay to v6 in the v1 there's a small r and a big s and as you keep on progressing towards the v6 the r is getting big and s is getting small and in the lead v3 r and s are almost equal and in v4 you can see it's a big r and a small s okay this is called the normal progression of the r wave okay there's something called the poor progression of the r wave in if in the v3 this r wave is, is less than three small boxes tall in other words 3 mm if it's less than 3 mm that's called poor progression of the r wave and the poor progression of the r wave could be a sign of the previous mi it is not specific for that but it could be it could be a normal variant it could be uh, a sign of the previous mi you need to look into the into the thing uh, here you can see okay in the v1 v2 v3 in the v3 you can hardly see a half small squared r wave so that's a poor progression of r wave it indicates a previous mi and t wave inversion you can see that okay so that's actually augmenting um our view of uh, that's a previous previous uh, uh, mi okay interior wall mi if the t wave is fine over here then you can look at the other causes as well okay it could be a normal variant as well now the next thing is the qrs okay it could be wide okay it could be wide and the wide qrs represents the bundle branch blocks okay let's discuss about the lbb and the rbb and for the lbb and the rbb you need to look at lead v1 v2 and v5 and v6 okay in the rbb there is rsr typical rsr pattern of rbb in the v1 and v2 and in the v6 v6 there is slurring of s wave a wide s wave and exactly opposite is over there in the LBB. In the LBB, in the V5, V6, there is a pattern and this slurring of or widening of the S wave is in V1 and V2. So in the RBB, V1, V2, RSR pattern and V5, V6 slurring. In the LBB, V5, V6 and pattern and V1, V2 slurring of the um, S wave. Okay, so here you can see M pattern in V5, V6 and this slurring of S wave in V1, V2 that's lbb now the next thing very important after the qrs there's st segment that's very important so you can see the st elevation okay over here st elevations and st depression they are very important okay because you're going to detect the ischemia by by them for detailed review of the st elevation okay and the criteria and the st depression i have a separate video you can refer to that okay now when you are looking for this st depression and st elevation okay this is st depression you need to look at okay inferior leads two three avf these are the inferior leads v1 v2 v3 v4 these are interior septal and one avl v5 v6 
these are the literal leads so whenever you are looking for the st segment depression or st segment elevation you need to look in this order you need to look at the inferior leads what i mean by that is if you have started looking at the v2 you need to look at three and avia at the okay after that because you find these changes in the contiguous leads it's not like you are looking at the two and the next you are looking at the one no you need to look at in, in this order okay the inferior leads okay in one time uh, little leads in one time interoceptal okay at one place at one time okay because you find the changes in the contiguous leads so this is uh, ST segment uh, elevation and the depression okay um, the next one is if you go over here is a T wave okay so for the T wave the rule is actually that a T wave sh is actually should be smaller than or equivalent to 1 by 3 of the subsequent r okay say for example let me tell you it over here oh so here it is okay so this is actually the r the height of the r so this t should be if i divide this in equal three parts okay this should be less than one by three of this successive r okay this this one where you are actually looking the t wave that are okay in in that complex of the ncg so it's less than one by three of that r if it's greater than um that are actually one by three of the r that's called a tall t wave okay or a hyper acute t wave you know okay uh, a tall t wave could be in the hyper Kalemia, okay and you know that the hyper acute t waves okay that will be there there will be st Elevation as well, okay. At the same hypercuity waves uh, represents the MI, while these tall T waves, okay, they represent the hyperkalemia. Okay, they could be the flat T waves or inverted T waves. Inverted T waves are non specific for the ischemia, they could be in the other things like hypokalemia as well. But one should keep in uh, the things in the mind like ischemia, hy hypokalemia, sorry, hypokalemia, the inverted T waves in the hypokalemia. So this is as far as the T waves are concerned. Um, now the next thing is you have the QT interval. Okay, you know that the QT interval um, from the start of the Q to the end of the T, that is a QT interval. A QT interval, it changes, okay, with your heart rate. If it's a bradycardia, that's going to give you a long QT. And if it's a tachycardia, that's going to give you a short QT. That's why we cal calculate sometimes something that's called QTC. That is equal to QT, that's corrected QT, that is equal to QT over under root RR. And we know that if it, the corrected QT, that is QTC, if it's greater than 0 0.44 seconds in the male, that is prolonged QT interval. And if it is greater than 0.46 seconds in, sorry, uh, in the female, here in the male, okay? So that is prolonged QT. We know that the prolonged QT is there in a number of conditions, okay? But like in the drugs, flicanide, myodron, quinine, um, the macrolides, SSRIs, okay, um, hypocalcemia, um, hypothermia, subarachnoid hemorrhage, okay, these all can give you the long QT and the short QT is over there in hypercalcemia. So that's all about the ECG. Thank you.